Welcome back, Laura. Thanks again for being on with us today. Great. It's great to be here. All right, Laura. So I loved what we talked about in the first segment, but obviously things don't always go perfectly. I'm also kind of wondering how you get buy-in for students. Like, do you have some real life examples that um, can kind of help, help the listener and me, frankly, like understand exactly how all this works? Yes. Great. Okay. So I, I love to give examples from the college clients that I've worked with just because the awareness, just from your listeners hearing about some of these examples, they're not there yet. Right. But just having an awareness around these skills, how they're going to be tested, how people that I've worked with have been tested and how a small adjustment in how the student's thinking can actually get them back on track pretty, pretty quickly Mm -hmm. Um, and feel better. Like the idea of all of this is that you are a, the goal is to be a confident student who feels good and not all the time, right? You're not happy all the time, but you generally feel confident in your ability to make the most of your college experience. It's such a big investment, both for the student and for the family. Like you do want to get the most out of this extremely unique you know, amazing privilege time. Like it's so mm-hmm. important, right. To make the most of it. So, you know, for one example of a student who, um, who needed a little help getting more future focused. So this student, um, David, so when I started working with him, he was in his sophomore year, he had just finished freshman year. He started in engineering. He thought he was going to be an engineer, like his whole high school career. He applied to a great school, got into their engineering program. Right. And when he got into those classes, he struggled. He, um, you know, always thought he kept thinking like, I was such a good science student and math student in high school. What's, what's the problem? Why is this not coming more easily to me? Mm-hmm. And then he would look around. So it was a little bit of compare and despair too. He'd look around at the students in the class and think they're so much more advanced than I am. I don't know if I'm in the right place. Right. So he started to doubt himself. And then really he, um, a lot of this happens for a lot of students. Um, I call it the fear of looking dumb. It's a very scientific term, but that's kind of (laughs) how I explain it. Mm -hmm. Some call it the imposter syndrome. You know, it's, it's generally like, don't say anything because then people will know that I don't understand what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Right. And the mentality is like, I'll just figure it out later on my own by myself Mm -hmm. so that nobody knows that I'm actually maybe not as smart as they thought when they admitted me to this college, right? <laughs> um, and so he had a lot of that. And the repeating question that when we, when I met him, he kept saying is like, I don't understand. I did fine in high school, mm-hmm. right? He knew how to study. He knew how to do homework, but he had this kind of overwhelming, like, oh gosh, did I make a mistake? Is this all wrong? Maybe I don't know what I want to do. Anyway, he decided to come out of engineering. And so when I met him, he was already a sophomore and it was like, he just, again, felt rudderless, right? My company is rudder coaching for a reason. Mm-hmm. Because he felt like, I don't even know what direction because he was so focused on the past. So we really did some work over a couple of weeks to get him kind of to make peace with what freshman year was and mm-hmm. realize that he was still in full control and he could create the college experience that he wanted without engineering and that he could really decide what he wanted to do going forward. And that, yes, it would feel uncomfortable as he created a new identity for himself, a new, you know, so he was taking creative writing classes. He was taking some bio, you know, so, and then he started to basically feel better, you know, and just kind of, and then that trickled into, he managed his time better. He got his work done better. He started Mm -hmm. study groups. He started talking to professors more, right? So just that little bit of like, Hey, let's stop thinking about last year and what was, and let's start thinking about what you want and what could, what could you could create for yourself. Kind of like, it just, it's like looking at the rear view mirror to then back to looking out the front, the front um, window of the car. And so he could kind of move forward. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of the future focused kind of, you know, high school was great, but like, let's move on and really think about what you want to create for yourself going forward. I want to, I'm sorry. I just want to highlight something too. I've run into this a lot where students feel like they can't ask for help. It's like they, they were the smart one in high school and they never needed help in high school. And so then they get to college and like asking for help is terrifying. And I'm like, your college, I've just looked it up. They have a writing center. They have a math center. They have tutoring. I mean, I've, I've looked it up for students and told them to use it. Right. Because it's that fear of looking dumb, Mm -hmm. right. That somehow they're not as smart as they were 
believe to be when they were admitted, right? Mm -hmm. Or that their peers are. So maybe they shouldn't be at that college, right? Like I had a student who kept saying like, I just got into this like amazing college. It was maybe her reach, it was her reach college, Mm -hmm. right? So she had this feeling like, oh my gosh, everybody around here is so much smarter. Therefore, and I had this too, where I was like, in my mind, the, the answer to, a, to not getting something was work harder, spend more mm-hmm. time, like go to the library for longer. Like you can figure it out, you know, which in my head sounded good. But on the other hand, it was like, look up all these people can help you. Mm-hmm. And just because you, you're not a genius, like for that student, it's like, just because you're not great at engineering, you just started engineering. Mm-hmm. You, you're not an engineering major yet. You are starting classes in engineering to become an engineering major when you graduate. That's mm-hmm. when you're an engineering major. You can declare it, but you're not the major yet. You become the major after you finish all the classes, right? Mm-hmm. So you're not supposed to have the like uber confidence when you start. That's okay, right? And so I actually uh, I'll work with my students a lot about asking for help. And I, and I teach them, there is actually a good way to think about asking for help. And this could be helpful for, for your listeners of, you know, there's a sweet spot of asking for asking for help, right? A lot of students that I've worked with are so into the habit of asking for help that they don't trust themselves, Mm. believe that they can figure out the answer on their own at all. Right. Right. They're constantly waiting for feedback from a friend about a paper or a professor to okay an idea or to go to the writing center before they even submit any, any small writing thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they don't actually have the confidence to take the next step on their own. But then you have the other, the other extreme where they don't ask for help at all because they think that figure it out yourself. Right. So I always like to teach my students. It's like, think about checking in. Okay. Where you have an, you have a problem or something you're working on, you're struggling with, and you have an idea for how you want to solve it. But there's so many brilliant resources at your campus. That's what they get paid for. Right. So check in with them. Like when you have a professor, like say, here's what I'm thinking about writing about for this paper. Does that make sense? Am I on the right track? It's a check-in. It's a right track. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have developed the skill, the muscle of solving your own problem but you're also checking in with these wonderful experts who are at the college, right? Why wouldn't you check in with them to see if they have any feedback, some things you missed, something Mm -hmm. you didn't consider, right? And then you get their perspective and then you just add it in to what you're already thinking, right? So there is like, you know, not too, don't wait too long, but don't go right away, right? Think Mm -hmm. about solving the problem on on your own and then find a resource on campus to check in with bring your idea of your solution to them and then they can help you see things maybe you missed. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the prescription for kind of for asking for help. Um, One other really good example is around the time management. So I had a student who she was, she was so smart. She had a, a business going on on the side. She was doing all her classes, right. And COVID, you know, was particularly hard for her not getting to campus, right. She was a very social person. So she was spending a lot of time, you know, inside like most college students last year. Um, And she really struggled with how to organize her time. So she would find herself um, getting behind on assignments. And then she felt so terrible that she was behind on the assignments that she would find herself scrolling on her phone. And then the next thing she knows, like an hour has gone by and now she's more anxious, which means she goes back to her phone. Right. Or then she's like, you know what? It's too late. I just need to go to bed. So then she would go to bed, wake up the next morning feeling terrible that like, you know, she was behind. Um, And she just really didn't have a system of laying out what she needed to get done for the day and then sticking to that plan. So really just some awareness around. And it was like, you know, the mindless scrolling, right, which we're all you know, we're all victim to at times, but bringing some awareness to how she was spending her time is what we went through. And then really getting her a system that worked for her to plan out her days. And really the the big key is, and I work with a lot of my students on this is Sunday night, Sunday afternoon. You don't really feel like doing too much work, but you know, the week's coming right. Sunday afternoon is the best time. Just sit down and you know, block out your week, map out your week, how I call it scheduling success, because Mm -hmm. if you can see it, if you can see how your week will could pan out, right. That you can fit all the things that you want into your week. If you can visually see it 
and your brain has evidence that it is possible to get the work done and hang out with the friends and get sleep and get some exercise once in a while and get some activities in, right? You're so much more likely to be able to follow through than if you just keep it all up in your head and think, oh, I'm just going to do this, this hour, and then this, and then this, because before you know it, the distractions are coming in big time, especially when you get to college, right? Mm -hmm. Distractions are so much more available. Um, And so what she just needed to do was a little bit of a system of time management. Then actually the most exciting part for her was she got her work done. She felt like she was doing better in her classes, but the biggest thing was she started making time and actually planning social events, like planning Mm -hmm. to hang out with her friends, which actually meant that she started to feel better about her relationships and making new friends because she kind of, again, COVID was part of it, but, Mm -hmm. but, um, but she felt like she wasn't really making friends. The more excited she was about making friends, guess how much more motivated she was to get her work done. Mm -hmm. When she had plans, right. To be with her friends at night, it was like, well, of course I'm going to focus and get my reading done now because I want to do that tonight. But before she had never been making plans because she thought she had to do work. Anyway, it's just like figuring out how it all works, um, is a big part of, um, you know, a lot of my work with students, there's some piece of, of time management and deciding how you're going to use your time. Mm -hmm. Uh, The last thing I'll say that I think is a huge awareness um, that can be really helpful for college students, entering college students, um, is the distinction between, and I I talk about this with my students a lot, the distinction between confidence and self-confidence, okay? So confidence is what most seniors are feeling now. They're generally believing, feeling good about their ability to do things, okay? So it's a, confidence is your ability, your belief in your ability to do a thing because you've Mm -hmm. done it already. Right. So they know they can make friends because they've made friends in high school. They know they can do the classwork because they just did it for four years. Right. So they have confidence in those areas. Now, self-confidence is different. So self-confidence is the belief in yourself, not your ability, but yourself that you will be okay. Even if you mess up, Mm -hmm. things go terribly that you can go do the new thing Because ultimately you're like, all right, if this come, if this is horrible and turns out terribly, I'll still be okay. I'll still be able to like, keep going on, right. Keep on trucking. Um, but self-confidence actually feels not great. Right. So I had a student who had a lot of confidence in her ability to write papers and to do the work academically, but she was really struggling with the self-confidence because she kept thinking, well, what if I you know, what if I write this idea in a paper and it's terrible and the professor hates it and I get a terrible grade and then I don't get into my master's program. And then my life's like, you know, she was taking it, (laughs) you know, which a lot of us call catastrophizing. It's a normal, it's a normal cognitive function that our brain does. It's trying to keep us safe, Mm -hmm. right? Your brain in that moment, you know, is trying to keep her safe, but self-confidence is, is literally your prefrontal cortex. This is the science behind it. Your prefrontal cortex telling your primal brain, which is designed to keep you safe. Like it's okay. If you write the paper and it doesn't get the grade you want, you'll be okay. Right. Right. So helping her realize that self-confidence is required to do new things. It still feels scary. The self-doubt is still there. You still feel vulnerable, but you do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And then on the other end of the new scary thing, right? Like submitting her papers without having the professor okay everything. That's what she she needed to do. Then she would submit them, feel nervous and terrible, but then realize, oh, I'm actually okay. The world is okay. Like I'm okay. So in, in college, you have to realize that when you do new things, it's going to feel uncomfortable. That doesn't mean that you're not, it, it's just the confidence comes after you do the thing. That good feeling comes after you do it. So like I had a student who took an exam. She got a terrible grade on that first exam in college. And she went into like a tailspin, like, okay, I'm not good enough to be here. Maybe this is the wrong college. Maybe I shouldn't be in this major. And it's like, no, no, this was your first college exam. Have you ever right. taken a college exam before? No. <laughs> okay. So let's not make it mean all these things. Let's just make it mean that maybe however you studied, we have to adjust. So don't go into the tailspin. That's the self-doubt. Let's just realize that everything's not going to go perfectly, but use it as 
um, that's mine, sorry, use it as information to go forward, to come up with a new strategy for next time. And then you just keep the progress going forward. You don't get stuck and feel terrible and kind of like that self-doubt feeling kind of takes over a lot. So you just yeah. keep forward. I often actually tell parents that as painful as it is for them to see it happen, actually having their kid fail in high school can be a good thing so that they, while their parents are there to say, I love you and you're, this is fine and you're going to get past this. Like I sort of worry more about the students where nothing has gone wrong and wrong in high school or nothing substantive. And then, yeah, they, they have their first like C on a test or essay or, and they're just like, wow, I'm a fraud. I'm a moron. I'm, you know. And the way that that looks is their student's not going to say that, but the student is going to not participate in class. They're not going to reach out for help. Mm -hmm. They're not going to form study groups. They're kind of going to go inward, right? And they're going to make conclusions, very quick conclusions, like this college is not for me. This major is not for me, right? That they're trying to, they want to scrap everything. It's like, no, no, no whatever you did before this exam, maybe just there's some strategy that you have to adjust. Mm -hmm. So it's not this big, you know, marker that something's gone horribly wrong, right? It's just, okay, whatever I did before that, let's, let me look what went well, what can I adjust? Maybe what new thing can I try for next time? Mm -hmm. And I always hope that students realize this is going to help them in the workforce too. I mean, there's even a Silicon Valley even has the expression fail upwards. Like yeah, you know, right. it's like you're, the first thing you invented didn't go beautifully in most cases. It's like it was a massive failure and then you start a different company or whatever. And that's that's how things go well. Right. And the, but the, it's just because there's so much like intense emotion when you get especially to freshman year, because largely it's like the first major decision you've made for yourself mm -hmm. right? with the family involved, of course. But like then it's like, oh, my God, am I not good at deciding things for my life? Mm -hmm. Right. Because maybe. I chose wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I've, I've ended up in a place that I shouldn't have. Maybe I can't trust myself, right? Which again, it's the self-confidence like, no, it's okay. Nothing's gone wrong here. Things like this will happen. As you say, they're supposed to happen. How will I handle this? What can I learn? Now the momentum keeps moving forward to that future focused mm -hmm. new knowledge version of yourself instead of like, oh my gosh, you know, everything I've built, everything that's come before me, maybe I've thrown it all away because something terrible has happened here. Right. And it's not this catastrophizing it's, you know, take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. College is going to have bumps, right. not a fantasy, fantasy land. You have to figure it out as you go, you will make it fit. And you're going to feel uncomfortable a lot of the time. Right. And the confidence really does come later. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, you know, but, but the more you seek to be uncomfortable, the more you will learn, the more you will make the most of your environment and you'll make great friends and you really will get the college experience you want. So it's not about feeling amazing and confident always. It's actually about feeling vulnerable, trying new things, putting yourself out there, growing into that new college version of you, you know, who's then going to be ready to take on whatever comes after college. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, this has been so helpful. I hope everybody listens to this. <laughs> I hope so too. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Laura. And again, this is Laura Amigon. Yeah. And from Rudder Coaching. Mm -hmm. Rudder Coaching. You can find her online. All right. So we're going to take a short break and then Michelle Richardson will be here to give suggestions on how to save money in honor of Save Smart Month. 